we're going to be looking at a critique, actually, of the book of James. Uh, and I'm going to start off with a story. Some of you have probably heard this story, others perhaps not. Uh, it just happened to be a, a man that called me out of the blue. He didn't know who I was. He thought he was calling the church building. And well, yeah, when you call the church's number, you, you get my number is what you get. And, uh, and this was late at, at night. Uh, it was late. It was about 10 o'clock at night on, on a Friday. And uh, he wanted an argument is what he wanted to do. He wanted to convince me uh, that, uh, uh, that baptism was not essential and that faith is all that one had to have. All, and, and that would be a faith that's been redefined by, really by men, uh, not biblical faith, but uh, a faith in just, just believing that there is a God and that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Basically, that, that's it. And he just wanted to, to convince me of that. And we go, uh, well, really round and round uh, with it. And uh, there are uh, certain things that he tried to use. Uh, one of the things that he believed is that we were uh, all born in sin. Well, we talked about that for a bit. And uh, uh, then, the, of course, it was the faith-only business. And, of course, I, if we're going to be talking about that, eventually we're going to get to the book of James. And so I bring up the book of James. Now, this is after probably about an hour into the conversation that I bring in the book of James because... Well, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about faith. Well, if you can talk, talk about faith, well, Hebrews 11 is a good place to discuss faith. Also, James is a good place to discuss faith, but we can go to other places as well of Abraham being the father of the faithful. We can, we can discuss these things, but I bring up James. And when I bring up James, he, he scoffs and he says, they always go to James. And I said, well, what's wrong with James? And he said, well, that's not really a book. Oh, well, it it's, happens to be in my Bible. Is it not in yours? Yeah, it was in his too. It was in his Bible as well. So what's the problem with James? What's, and, and he actually accused me because I didn't accept his interpretation of a particular passage. I didn't accept it and showed him how it, it, here is the better interpretation and also scripture to back that up. He, it, and, and he said back then, he said, you're tossing out scripture. And I said with this, when we get to the book of James, I said, you just threw out an entire book of the Bible. That's what you've done. Now, we're going to discuss this. Now, two years ago, and it's been two years because I checked, uh, this was part of our, our class on James. This was included uh, in that class. And well, there were those that, that weren't in that class, and it's been two years anyway. But this has to do with Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther lived from the years 1483 to 1546. He was German. He was uh, a monk and also a priest. It depends on when you're talking about his life. He also taught at a college uh, in um, uh, uh, Wittenberg, and uh, he is well known uh, because of the, uh, he took his 95 thesis and he hammered it, uh, nailed it to the door there at the, uh, the church, uh, the, their cathedral, whatever it is, at Wittenberg. Okay, and it had to do his thesis. I, I wouldn't have anything actually much against what he was saying in that because it had to do with a major problem with the Catholic Church and that was the selling of indulgences and some of his arguments in it were absolutely, I'd have to look at it again, it's been a while, were spot on. That yet yeah, no human authority has the power to do these things and he was correct in that. And he also followed something that was, that began, well it was a saying, Sola Scriptura, or Solo Scriptura. And that means Scripture alone, or just Scripture, but Scripture alone. That is the idea that the Bible is the only source of authority in Christianity, that the Bible is the final 
authority for all matters of faith and morals because of its inspiration, authority, clarity, efficacy, meaning it works, and sufficiency. Okay, now I would say it's the final authority because it's from God. And you can find all these other things as well, but it's from God. That's why it is the final authority. It's, it's inspired. And now, this idea of sola scriptura, now that is right. Scripture only. But that means follow Scripture only. Because some people will say it, like those in the, the Reformation movement, they said it and that is good because what they were doing is breaking themselves away from the, the papacy, from the Pope and, and all, of, all of Roman Catholicism. They were breaking themselves away from that because it wasn't just Scripture only under Roman Catholicism. And it still isn't. All right. And so what they were saying was in fact correct, but they didn't go far enough. They did a good job as to, to a degree, but not far enough of take Scripture. And even if you do not agree with Scripture, understand it's from God and it is to be followed. And perhaps you need to change your mind and not toss out an entire book. Now, let's look at what Martin Luther says about James. And I'm quoting him. Of course, this is translated in English. He, he would have uh, written these things in German or Latin, one or the other. But this is a quote. Therefore, St. James, he means the, the epistle, St. Saint, Saint James's epistle is really an epistle of straw having no, no substance to it whatsoever. It can't be from God. Compared to these others, and he's talking about the other books of the New Testament, for it has nothing to do of the nature of the gospel about it. Now we're going to examine this, whether this is true or not. Because what we're going to find out is Martin Luther, as intelligent as he was, I mean, he, he did teach in that college, as intelligent as he was and as knowledgeable as he was, shows himself to really have very little knowledge about the book of James because he doesn't like it, he's going to reject it and make these, these claims. Now, he never says the book of James should be taken from the Bible. That's credit to him. He never said that. But he does say it shouldn't be taught. Well, what's the difference? All right, what's the difference? Don't take it out, but don't teach it either. But here's more of what he had to say. We, we should throw the epistle of James out of this school. Now, that's what he's saying, because that's, he, he taught there in Wittenberg. For it doesn't amount to much. It contains, now notice what he says, not a syllable about Christ. Not once does it mention Christ except at the beginning. Okay, so he just destroyed that little argument. He doesn't make mention of Christ, well, except the beginning. All right, but we're going to look at that and we're going we're to examine this. I maintain, continuing with Martin Luther, I maintain that some Jew wrote it who probably heard about Christian people but never encountered any, since he heard that Christians place great weight on faith in Christ, he thought, wait a moment, I'll oppose them and urge works alone. This he did. Now, that's a just so story. He has no proof of that at all. He's just making that up of this is probably what happened. Some Jewish man just decides he wants to undermine Christianity and put it into uh, bring, change, change up some things here and, and it's got to be works alone, which actually James doesn't say. James does not say it's works alone. He never does. And the problem with this is that any time you oppose Scripture, in this case, the book of James. There's a whole lot of other things you're going to have to throw out because 
Paul also writes about faith. The Hebrews writer also writes about faith and combines them with obedience. That would be works. Obedience is important in this. All right, now, I just want to make mention concerning his 95 Thesis that Luther appeals to Scripture only once in his 95 Thesis. Okay, only, only once. And which I don't know why he, why, why he does that because there could be plenty of scriptures that could have been used in those 95 theses to show that uh, the selling of indulgences and the abuses of the papacy is absolutely wrong. And of course, when he writes that, when he puts up his 95 theses, when he puts that up, he doesn't expect anybody outside of the school to really notice. It's just something he did because it's what you did. If you, had, if you wanted to have some kind of religious discussion, some kind of, of thing that may be debated or it may just, just a, a simple discussion, that you would, you would put that up on the, on the door of the church there. You, that's where it was. It's, it was, was kind of like a campus tradition. That's what they did. And so he puts it up there and then it, it explodes out of that and suddenly you've got the Pope that wants him dead. All right, and, and others willing to do it as well. And actually Luther said concerning his own earlier life that he would have killed for the Pope earlier. He would have killed for him that he would, have, he would have committed murder if he was told to do so by the Pope. But let's just look. Okay, so we're going to look first off of that whole idea of there is no mention of Christ except at the beginning. And like I said, that's, you just threw out your whole argument right there. It begins to deflate. But 1.1, 1, 1, James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay, so I guess that's the beginning. So that should be the only time that Christ is mentioned. It should be. But Luther either didn't know the book of James, which I doubt, I doubt that, or he's lying. Or he's just so, uh, just wants it out of the text that he's willing to say whatever to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad." All right, so already he has bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have Jesus who is called Christ and he's also called Lord in this verse, in this first verse. And that's important because of what we're gonna, we're gonna see. Whenever we see the word Lord in the book of James, it would have to refer back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who else would it be? because he calls him Lord from the beginning, from verse 1. So we go to verse 7. For let not a man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Well, that's got to be Christ. Does he have to call him Lord Jesus Christ every time? Does he have to do that? Now, he's going to do it again, just a second. But we go to verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has received... Oh, I'm sorry, when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life from the, for uh, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. All right, now here's something I want to bring out now. Not only is he calling him Lord again, but there is something else that just happened in verse 12 and something that also goes to disprove his whole idea that these other books, other books of the New Testament, are, are so much better. And those are valid, but this one is invalid, and it doesn't have any of the elements of the, of the other books. What James just did, actually it's the Holy Spirit, the crown of life. There's only one other place one other place where that term is used, the crown of life, and it's not James, it's the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation refers to the crown of life. Now, is James 
Is he copying this from the book of Revelation? No, because quite likely the book of Revelation hasn't been written when this was written. Was John, who penned the book of Revelation, copying from James? I would say no once again because it's the Holy Spirit who's behind both of them. And word for word determines what goes in. And we'll use terms that can be in just a couple of books or maybe in a handful of books and, and nowhere else. And sometimes you may have a discussion that's found nowhere else, such as what we find in the book of Hebrews and the discussion of Christ as our high priest under the order of Melchizedek. That's only in the book of Hebrews. That's only there that you find that. Man, that's the way that the Holy Spirit has designed all of this. But here we see, yeah, Revelation 2.10, uh, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And if he is copying, if he's copying the book of Revelation, which like I said, book of Revelation, I doubt seriously had been written yet, he's quoting Christ. Because Christ is saying that in Revelation 2 and 10. He's quoting Christ here, but that's not the only place where he quotes Christ. Now, we go to chapter 2 and verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality. Now, it seems to me, how many times? One, two, three, four times, and we've just gotten to chapter 2, verse 1. Four times he has called him Lord, two times Lord Jesus Christ. Seems to me like somebody doesn't know what they're talking about or is holding something back. Chapter 5 and verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Now that matches up with a New Testament teaching that Christ is going to return for judgment. He's going to be returning for judgment. Tell me what book of the New Testament that doesn't match. Tell me which one. Tell me how that doesn't match with the rest of the, the New Testament. Because it does. Jesus preaches it on the Sermon of the Mount. And we're going to need to, to look at some things at a later date on that. Jesus teaches that from the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, in, in Matthew. Matthew chapter uh, uh, 7, he's specifically talking about that. But now we, we just look at verse 8. Well, actually, we didn't finish verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives an early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Once again, tell me how that doesn't match with other books of the Bible. Seems to me like James knows a lot Seems to me he knows more than Martin Luther knows. Seems like he's, he's got it. Now, we go to, in, in looking at here at verse 8, he says, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 8. We go to chapter 2 and verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, look at this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. What did he just do there? He quoted Christ. So there's, there's not a, the first thing concerning Christ in this. He just quoted Christ. Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39, Mark 12, 31. This is also brought up in Luke 10, 27, though in that particular passage, Christ didn't say it, but it's still a, but he did in the other two books. 
And Jesus agrees in, in Luke 10, 27, that that was correct. Okay? And so James is quoting Christ. So we go to chapter 5, verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. What did he just do there? He quoted Christ again, but now from the Sermon on the Mount. He just quoted Christ again. I think we could find, and I haven't thought about it until just now, it's possible, it's possible we can find a book in the New Testament that doesn't make a direct quote of Christ. It's possible. I haven't thought about it until now, and I'm having trouble trying to find it uh, in my mind. It's possible, but James is not one of them. James is not one. James is quoting here. And yeah, this is, this is a direct quote of Matthew 5.37. And uh, now, also in 5.14, James is familiar with the church. Not only is he familiar with quotes of Christ and calling him Lord and Christ, but he's also familiar with the church. Verse 14, so James 5, verse 14, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Once again, calling him Lord. But notice, he says, call for the elders of the church. He knows something about the church and the organization of the church. He knows that a local congregation should have, that doesn't always the case, should have elders. If they're able to have elders, they should have elders. And now not every one of them could, but Call for the elders. James appears to know more about Christ and his church than Martin Luther does. He appears to know a whole lot more. Because I'm not sure that this would have made so much sense of let him call for the bishops. Okay? Because getting, getting one bishop would be hard enough. I'm talking about in the Catholic Church. Getting one bishop to go visit somebody who's sick would be hard enough. Now you're going to get two or more to go there? Now that's going to be something. Maybe if it was an important royal, some, some king or prince, yeah, perhaps. Some very wealthy person, perhaps. But that's just not happening. Matter of fact, during the bubonic plague, which did hit uh, through the world numerous times. It wasn't just a one-time event. It came, it just repeated over different points at different years through different centuries actually. But one of the things that, and it, and it did occur during Martin Luther's day as well. And it's one of the things that he complained about is that you have the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and it was like bishops, archbishops, pope, cardinals, all right, with the bubonic plague, so much for compassion. They left. They, they hightailed it out of the city and they quarantined themselves. They were not going to be among the sick. They were not going to comfort anybody. They weren't going to pray over anybody. They weren't going to do something like this. No way were they going to. I think Martin Luther would have known that by this, by this point that he's talking about the book of James, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure when, when he, he uh, did that as to when the, uh, the, the plague occurred during his lifetime. Now, let's talk about similarities with the rest of Scripture, because we have it. The book of James mentions several people, not just Christ. How many times? How many times have, have we seen Christ being mentioned thus far? Several. How many times 
has he does he have to be mentioned? How many times does he have to be mentioned in a book for it to be a valid book? Well, that's a good question because I can show you the book of Ruth and show you where the name of God is not there. No, I'm sorry, Esther. I can show you Esther where where uh, there is no there's no mention there. Is is that a is that a bad thing? Does that disqualify that book? Does it? There's certainly nothing wrong about, about that book. But the fact of the matter is, you can't make that claim about the book of James. But James mentions Abraham. And in uh, chapter 2, verses 21 to tw uh, 23, he mentions Abraham, and that's a significant portion of the book of Genesis. 2.25, he mentions Rahab, that's Joshua chapter 2, and also other books that will mention uh, Rahab in, in the book of, um, oh, well, just later on, there will be mentions, Matthew chapter 1 mentions Rahab. All right, Elijah. Elijah is mentioned in chapter 5, verse 17. Well, that's 1 Kings and 2 Kings because Elijah is found at, in uh, the, really the, the latter part of 1 Kings and the very first part of 2 Kings. He also mentions Job in 5.11. Well, that's the entire book of Job. Is there anything wrong with this? Well, you know, no, not really. But we also now look at references. James 1, 21, he speaks of the implanted word. Well, that goes right hand in hand with the parable of the sower. That's found in Matthew chapter 13, 3 through 9, and then 18 through 23 where it's explained, but also Luke 8, 5 through 15. All right, so the, the parable of the sower would be the implanted word. That's what that seed is. James 2, 23, Abraham is called the friend of God. Well, 2 Chronicles 20 and 7, Abraham, your friend forever. 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 7. James 1, chapter, I'm sorry, James 1, 2 through 4. Let's read it. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, let's just turn over to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, that sounds like the same writer, if you ask me. Now, it's not. Romans is written by Paul. James is written by James. But there is one author, and that's the Holy Spirit behind it all. Does James contradict the book of Romans? No, not at all. We can go to, uh, now to, uh, to James chapter 4. James 4 and verse 6. Here is a, another quote. James 4 verse 6, But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's Proverbs 3 and verse 34. So James is not connected to the biblical text at all. I'd have you know that in fact, he is. The books used in James, Genesis, Joshua, 1st and 2nd Kings, Chronicles, that'd be 2nd Chronicles, Job, Proverbs, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And both James 1 verse 12 and Revelation 2 10 use the same term, that of the crown of life, and no one else does. Now, it seems to me like there's an awful lot of similarities in all this. There is a lot that it is as connected as any other book. 
How is James 2, which that's really the part that uh, Martin Luther didn't like, that would have been the part. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God, you do well, even demons believe and tremble, but do you, do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He's not saying works only. He's not saying that at all. He's saying faith without works is dead. Now, we made mention earlier, you take out one verse, you take out in this case, one book, you're going to find that there are other books and other scriptures, other verses that are going to agree with what you threw out. So you're going to have to start throwing more out. The book of Romans agrees with this. The book of Hebrews also agrees with this fully because Hebrews 11 shows by faith Abel. And then what Abel did, gave a more perfect sacrifice, gave a more acceptable sacrifice. By faith, Noah did what? Built the ark. That's what he did. By faith, Moses. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Rahab. By faith, showing that faith has action to it and obedience to it. That's exactly what Abel did. Abel is obeying God. Noah is obeying God. Enoch is obeying God. That's all, all that is there, and there is an absolute agreement. Now, throw out this book, you might as well, just, just throw out the Bible and don't pretend. Just throw out the Bible. Well, some people can't quite stomach that. Well, then do the better thing the best thing, and that is accept it all. Because you're not going to find any contradictions. If you find contradictions between two verses, your ideas on at least one of them, or perhaps both, is flawed. And it's exactly as Peter states at the uh, end of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, talking about as also, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them, he's talking about Paul, speaking in them of these things in which are some, which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they also do the rest of Scripture. All right. They can't stop with one because... The, actually, the Bible won't, well, that won't let you stop with one. It'll be the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. And pretty soon you'll discover you don't have Christ anymore. Pretty soon you'll discover you have to throw Christ out as well. And because Christ agrees, all Scripture is tied tightly together. And we see James is doing that. And it would be an excellent study to look to see how various books are tied with other books. And you're going to find in the Old Testament, you're going to find in the New Testament. where And also how Christ ties Himself tightly to Scripture. He does. Now, it's going to be Old Testament Scripture because the New Testament hadn't been written at that point. But He ties Himself to, to uh, the validation of that of, of what was said in the past, what was written in the past. Now, this is a, a, a sermon that's not meant to be evangelistic, but it is one to show how false teachers don't have much of a claim on anything. And that here you have this man highly admired in his day, admired today by many. Go to your average seminary, and uh, not, not, a, 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 not a Catholic one, but go to your average Protestant seminary. They're going to discuss Martin Luther. Then probably uh, some of the things that he wrote. Probably. Highly admired. But it seems to me like he knew very little about this book of the Bible or he's just lying about it. And if he knows that little about that book and lied about that book, 
What else does he know or lie about? What else would there be? Not to trust man, but God. Let God be true and every man a liar. If God says one thing and some man says another thing contradicting God, take God. If God says one thing and the serpent says the absolute opposite, take God's word. Always. We are here now. We need to grow in wisdom. We need to go grow spiritually. We need to grow in our diligence and works. We need to grow in the, uh, the things that we have been called to do because this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And this is something that's going to take patience and endurance. And we improve, we should anyway, and grow as we progress from day to day. We ask this evening, if you need to respond to the invitation, that you come as we stand and sing.